two scriptural references I want to uh, invite you to find in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 and then Matthew's gospel chapter 9. So Hebrews chapter 13 and then Gos the gospel of Matthew chapter 9. Uh, I've given you several other, other references. Uh, Hebrews 4.12, uh, you all recall that it talks about the word of God. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is alive and active. It's living. It's a living word. And then Jeremiah 1.12, the prophet said, God is watching over his word to perform it. In Matthew 24 and 35, uh, scripture declares the words of our Savior, heaven and earth will pass away, my words will never pass away, which tells us the words of God are eternal. Not only they are alive and active and powerful, uh, not only is God watching over his word, but the word of the Lord is eternal, it's forever. Psalms 103 declares some of the characteristics of our God, that he is a God who forgives us of all of our sins and iniquities. He's a God who heals us of all of our diseases. Then it goes on and it says, Oh, that men would give him praise for the gracious and the wonderful works that he has displayed among men. Psalms 107 and verse 20. Uh, the people of God were in captivity and the Lord said, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. So God not only uh, has given us his word, and uh, we have it and can look upon it and behold it that's alive and active and powerful, that he's watching over, that's eternal, that not only teaches us that he forgives and heals us, it also reminds us that he sends it unto us as a gift. What a great gift the word of the Lord is. And when you hear God's word, faith comes alive because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I just love the word of God. And the more I hear it, the more I love it, because the more it produces life and the life of faith. And then Acts 10.38, this is Luke giving an account of Jesus when he goes to Cornelius' house. And uh, he begins uh, to say how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good. Now listen to the next phrase, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Well, therefore, we would have to say that healing is good. You know, uh, one man said it this way, you know, I've been sick and I've been well, and well is better. And uh, all of us who have had days where we haven't felt well, uh, we thank God for the days that we do feel well. But there is a path that God has for us to walk on where we can experience healing and health in our life and wholeness. And that's what we want to learn as his children. We want to stay on the path that the Lord has for us and he is he's guiding and governing us on this path and so we just need to know you know how to get on this path and then the path takes care of the provision you know if you're on the right path you're going to run into the right provision you get off course then you know you need to get back on course and it doesn't take much to get back on course with the Lord aren't you thankful his mercy endures forever but if you're ever off you can get on again to mean, to get off, off the course, off the path, means at one time you were on the path. So you know where to go, you just need to get there. And I'm not sure who that's for, but that's for somebody. Because, you know, if you're off, you can get on. I know where to go to get help. And you do too. So let's not hesitate. Let's not say, well, I'll wait for them, or one of these days, or when I feel like it, or when I'm done doing what I'm doing. Well, if you, what you're doing isn't helping you, then quit doing it. Because all you're doing is just digging the ditch deeper. I mean, if what you're doing right now isn't helping you and, get, and getting you farther down the road, my encouragement to you and my admonition is stop. Just stop doing it. You said, well, well what, what, what else could I do? Well, go back and do what you know to do. And uh, most of us know what we need to do. We just need encouragement to go back and do it. <laughs> and uh, so I, I hope you're encouraged by that today. And then uh, Hebrews 13.8. Uh, Hebrews 13.8. And then you have that right there in front of you. It says, Jesus Christ is, not might be, he is the same when yesterday, today, and forever. So if we can understand what Jesus did in times past, we can understand he's doing it today and he'll do it tomorrow. So there's always a learning curve with us. 
And sometimes we have to unlearn old things to learn new things, and that's quite a learning curve within itself. Because some people actually believe that, you know, God's word used to be alive and powerful and active. God used to watch over his word. You know, you know that, that God used to forgive and heal. Maybe he still forgives, but I don't know about healing. And so they've just sort of relegated their understanding of God or God's ways or the plan of God to their own experiences. And we all, we all have had moments where, you know, we wish things would have happened uh, more quickly, maybe even in a different manner. Uh, maybe in a different season, but it doesn't mean that the Lord's changed. The Lord doesn't change. He's the same. He said, I'm the Lord, I change not. And therefore, sometimes we need to make that slight adjustment on our behalf and get back and start rejoicing. Lord, I thank you that your word is alive and active and powerful. Lord, I thank you that you're watching over your word. I thank you that your word is relevant, it's eternal. I thank you that your word teaches me, that you forgive me, and you heal me. I thank you that you sent your word to me and delivered me from all destruction. See how quick that adjustment can happen? I mean, we can go from one minute to worrying and doubting and fussing and, you know, just being full of anxiety because we're not seeing things happen the way we want to or we're sort of basing our understanding of God and his ways upon the things that we're going through at that moment. But just flip the switch. It doesn't take much to flip the switch. If you're in the dark in your house and you have a light switch there, it doesn't take long for you to take two steps and flip the switch. There's no need to stay in the dark. There's no need to stay in the dark with who the Lord is and what he wants to do. We just need to go back and be reminded for one simple reason. We need to be reminded. We have a tendency to forget. Or for some people, they've never heard. And if they haven't heard, well, we want them to hear so that they can grow and they can experience what God has provided for them. Now, healing is included in the, in the atoning work of Jesus upon the cross. And Isaiah chapter 53 talks about, you know, surely, surely, or truly, uh, or verily, verily, that uh, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And uh, by his stripes were healed. And then Matthew 8, 17, it was, uh, it was recorded that so it would be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And then in 1 Peter 2, 24, Peter's looking back at the work of the atoning work of Jesus upon the cross and uh, said that by his stripes you were healed. So you have a prophet foretelling of not only the forgiveness that mankind would receive through the Messiah, but the healing that would be provided for us. Then Jesus in his ministry was, mealing, uh, was, was meeting people's physical needs in Matthew chapter 8. You can pick up right there, read Matthew 8, 9, and 10, and just one account after another account after another just of Jesus ministering to people's physical needs. And why was he doing that? He was fulfilling what Isaiah spoke about him that by his stripes we'd be healed. He did it in advance. He knew where he was going and what he would provide, and so he just ministered to people, and Peter talked about it after the fact, after the resurrection, that he is still the Lord who heals us. And then one of the redemptive names of God is Jehovah Rapha, which is, I am the Lord who heals you. So if he was, then he is, and he always will be. His name reveals his nature, and since his nature is a healer, he's always a healer. And his nature hasn't changed. Therefore, what his name reveals about his nature is still available to us today. And here we are in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. And this is a very important aspect of our teaching this morning. We'll begin in the first verse. So he, Jesus, got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then, behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes uh, said within themselves, This man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? But, you may, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, 
Arise, take up your bed, and go, your, uh, go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Then when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power or authority to men. So this is where Jesus forgives and he hear, heals a paralytic. And uh, this is also recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5. And, and there's a little bit more de detail in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, where these, the, the, the friends of this paralytic actually came to where Jesus was teaching. And uh, they ripped off the roof and they led him down into the presence of all of those who were there. In Luke's account, it says, And the presence of the Lord, or the virtue, or the power, the healing presence of the Lord, was there to minister to everyone. But only one got healed. And yet the healing power or the presence of the Lord was there to minister to everyone. But only one out of the everyone got it. Why? Because of the operation of faith. Some were just sitting there because maybe it was a place they thought they should be. Maybe there was a benefit for them being there. Maybe some of them were spying out and... Uh, and trying to catch Jesus in his words. But there was a group of them that showed up that day, and they showed up intentionally. I mean, they ripped the roof off. That's how serious they were. I mean, they weren't playing games. And they were going to get what they needed to get, and they knew who had it, and they had to get in his presence. When they got there, they got it. That's faith. Amen. And you know, sometimes we just sort of mealy mouth and sort of play games with God and say we want something, but how bad do you want it? I mean, are you ready to do something that, you know, absolutely is out of, out of the comfort zone? And, of course, God was so pleased with what took place that that man not only walked away with, uh, with uh, healing, uh, any sin that would ever be held against him was forgiven. What's the, the, the point that I, that I wanted to bring out primarily in this? is that it's just as easy for the Lord to forgive us as it is for him to heal us. So how many of you have ever received forgiveness for any of the sin that you've ever committed? Can I get an amen? amen. And you had to go to the Lord, how? By faith. And what did you need to do? Confess your sin. And what did he do? He cleansed you of all of your sin and half your unrighteousness. No, all your unrighteousness, right? And so all you had to do was show up and acknowledge he's the one who forgives and you receive forgiveness. Well, could it be as simple as just showing up and asking the Lord for healing mercy or a healing touch and going to him in faith? Well, how did a person get to the place, first of all, let's back up to forgiveness. How did a person get to the place where they believe that God would forgive them? How did they get faith to believe that God would forgive them? Well, someone told them. Someone told them, if you'll go to the Lord, he'll forgive you. If you confess to the Lord, he'll cleanse you. If you acknowledge your sin before the Lord, he'll wipe out your account of sin and the deadness of sin. And you simply took that message, responded to it in faith, and received a need met. Now, you and I both know depending on what we're talking to the Lord about when it comes to forgiveness, sometimes we have to just keep walking it out over the next several days. Sometimes there's a sense of shame or embarrassment or regret that we've done something against the Lord, but the Lord forgave us instantaneously. Now, I'm going somewhere with this, so follow me. So if the Lord forgave us instantaneously... And yet sometimes we struggle with something that we permitted or we allowed or we did and we knew we shouldn't have done it. And even though we've gone to the Lord and we asked him to forgive us and he forgave us because he's faithful, even when we're not, he can't deny himself. So when we come, he cleanses, he forgives, he makes us righteous, he does all of that. But the struggle comes on our end. Afterwards, sometimes if we don't feel forgiven, Sometimes we struggle with believing we are forgiven. And the enemy can be right there also, can he? And saying, do you believe the Lord's really going to forgive you? Look at the mess that you made. 
How many times are you going to have to ask the Lord to forgive you for this particular grievance the grievance, or this sin that you've committed? You've just wore the Lord out. You really don't mean it. And so we have to fight through, what? Forgiving ourselves sometimes. And then hushing or silencing the accuser of our soul, the enemy of all of humanity, Satan, and telling him, first and foremost, God is faithful. I haven't been, but God has been. And God has forgiven me. And he's the only one qualified to forgive me. And I need forgiven, and I know I need forgiven, so I receive my forgiveness. And you start talking like that, and the enemy just packs up his bag of lies, and he leaves pretty quick. Because you're not basing your ability to be forgiven on your good behavior. You're basing it on God's ability to cleanse you. You're basing it on his redemptive work upon the cross. Well, the same thing can be true when it comes to healing or walking in health or experiencing the blessing of the Lord in that way. At the same time that Jesus was on the cross and he bore our sins and iniquities is the same time he carried our sicknesses, our sorrows, and our pains. At the same time. So I'm going to propose a few things. I think in order for us to believe that the Lord is still the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he's still the Lord who heals us, that his nature hasn't changed and his name reveals his nature, I think we just need to hear this message until it really just settles some arguments that we have. We need to hear it, and we need to hear it, and we need to hear it. Just like you heard that God is merciful, God is patient, God is forgiving, and God will cleanse you, and you heard that to the place that you acted on it, and you received your need met. The same thing happens with healing. Then I've written in your notes, the above are just a few foundational truths referencing that healing is included in the will of God for humanity. But this leads us to a good question that must be answered if we're going to receive healing from the Lord. And here's the question. How is he healing today? Sometimes we can read the Bible and we can say, well, I can understand, wow, you know, how that took place for those people, but how does it happen for me? And so that's what I'm going to be spending time on over the next couple of weeks is just talking about the various ways. I, sometimes I use the, the, the term paths in which we can walk and receive healing. And healing is something that uh, we all need because some days we're just not that healthy. But the Lord still loves us and wants to minister to us. So let's take a look at, uh, first of all, what I've categorized as just your faith. And we know it's not our faith. It's the faith that comes to us from the Word of God. But uh, we're going to look in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5. We're going to look at two accounts here. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, and then Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Let's look in verse 12 through 16. Luke 5, 12 through 16. And it happened when he, Jesus, was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. And he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and he touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one. But go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear, and this is an important phrase, and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Uh, several things that we need to consider in this text is that the ripple effect of one man coming to Jesus allowed many people to come to Jesus. The testimony of one led to the victory and the testimony of many. 
And so how does God heal? Sometimes he heals the masses, but many times it's just one at a time. But that one healing could lead to multitudes of others being ministered to. Yes. So your testimony is very important. Yes. Jesus thought it was so important that after this man was ministered to, he said, you have to go tell somebody as a testimony. And you have to bring a gift to God in appreciation and gratitude for what the Lord has done. And I think therein is a test for some of us. We want the Lord to do what we want him to do, but sometimes we won't be that silent witness. But the Lord wants us to communicate what he's done so that others could be strengthened and encouraged and blessed and come and see their needs met. Your testimony is influential and powerful. So this man obviously started the conversation. When I say your faith, Jesus didn't come to this man and ask, what do you want me to do for you? This man came to Jesus and said, I need your help. He had faith in Jesus. The text tells us later why he had faith. Because he was one of those people that came to hear and be healed. He didn't just come to be healed. He came to hear and be healed. When he heard something, it had to be along the lines of healing because that's what he asked the Lord to do. And the Lord did it. And the Lord did several things that affirmed the value uh, and the worth of this man. He touched him, which in that culture is something that you were not permitted to do. You were not permitted to touch a leper lest you come and, in, 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 you know, contract that, that horrible disease. But Jesus touched him, saying, no, I, I'm, I'm here, and it's more than ability. I have a willingness to do this for you. Here we see the heart of God. We would never question none of us, is God able? We look all, uh, all around us and we say, God is able. Yeah, the, 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 the thing we wrestle with is, is God willing to do it for me? Is God willing to help me with my leprosy, with my infirmity? Oh, I know what he's done for others, but is he willing? Well, here's, here's my admonition to you. Are you just willing to come to Jesus? Acknowledge that there's something that you need him to do and accept his touch upon your life. Because that's how that need was met. Let's turn the page here. Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. And he, Jesus, came down with them, and he stood on a level place with the crowd of his disciples. And a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him, notice this next phrase, and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. So here we see that these people came, first of all, because they valued what Jesus had to say. They placed importance upon his words. And just as a reminder, his words are still alive and active and powerful today. And when we place value and significance on the word of God and we posture ourselves to hear the word of God, then we are going to receive our needs met because whatever you're hearing will produce faith for you in that area. If you need faith for forgiveness, you need to hear forgiveness scriptures. If you need faith for healing, you need to heal, hear healing scriptures. If you need faith for finances, you need to hear financial scriptures. And whatever particular area you need to hear, when you hear it, then you will receive faith in that area to receive your need met. But sometimes, honestly, we're the consumer Christian. We just want to come and get what we can from Christ, and then go our merry way. And yet he's requiring us first to come and just sit and listen to what he has to say and what he has to share. 
So this, once again, stretches our schedules and causes us to really consider and ponder the path that we need to be walking on. Everyone wants something from the Lord, but not everyone gets all that they need from the Lord or ever taps into everything that he's provided for them, myself included. And that's why we need to be reminded of these truths over and over again. So I just made a statement that God, that God can meet all of our needs. Is that true? Yes. No matter what they are? Yes. I do believe that. He's still the God who meets all of our needs. And then it's how, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So if I believe that God can meet all my needs, I need to learn some about the riches of Christ Jesus. Because it's according to the riches of Christ Jesus that those needs are met. And the more I know about the riches of Christ Jesus, the more I can tap into the Lord who meets all of my needs. If you don't know about the riches of the inheritance that you have in Christ Jesus, then wouldn't it be challenging to go to the Lord to ask for something that you don't even know about or aren't even aware of? You can have this awareness that I believe God is able to meet all my needs, but you don't know about the riches that meet the needs so how are the needs going to get met? How many of you believe, we'll just stay here for a minute. We'll just keep circling the wagon. Now, I'm okay with that. How many of you believe that God forgives and God can forgive anyone and everyone? No matter what they've done. I believe that. I mean, there's one sin, the unpardonable sin. But I don't know anyone who's ever committed it. Because there's so many requirements in order to get to that place that your heart is so hardened that you would completely reject the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and his shed blood and his power and his resurrection. I've, I know very few people that get there. I know people that are wayward. I know people that are shipwrecked. I know people that are wandering. I know people that are stuck. But I, I don't know anyone, personally, I've never met anyone in, in almost 40 years of ministry that has committed the unpardonable sin. I don't. I, I, now, it's one of Satan's favorite cards. That you must have, the reason that you're not experiencing the Lord's best or his highest or his blessing is you've committed the unpardonable sin. But the very fact that you're concerned about committing the unpardonable sin shows me you haven't committed it. Because if you were concerned about committing, you know, the person that commits the unpardonable sin doesn't care. Now, people may say at times that it doesn't matter, it's no big deal, but you put a white light on them in a lie detector machine and you ask them, do you believe that Jesus still loves you? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And they may be struggling, they may be shipwrecked, they may be stuck, they may be lost, they may be confused, but you put a white light, and you put them on a lie detector machine, and they'll still believe. They may be struggling with what they believe, but they still believe. And God works with strugglers. Let's work with one right here. That's right. And God doesn't mind working with strugglers, because the only way that you get, you get stronger is with God and you working through the struggles. God will leave some of the struggles so you'll go to him and get stronger, to be honest about it. He didn't commission them, but they're here. He won't take them all away because they lead us to him. I found that to be true in my life. So let's get back to is forgiveness available to everyone? All right. Here's the second part of that question. Will there be people that perish because they don't receive forgiveness? But is it, is it available? Has it been purchased? Has it been paid for? Did Jesus' blood on the cross pay the atoning debt of sin for humanity? So that whoever would call upon his name would be saved. Yes? 
God can save anyone. But they have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. It just doesn't happen because Jesus did it. Now it can. It can happen. And are we aware of the various ways in which the Lord still heals people today? It can happen. And the Lord wants it to happen. But getting back to our text, there are things that we're going to have to do. And we do them based on what we hear. When you hear something, then I believe the Lord says you're able to do it. When you hear it, you're qualified. You're capable. And just take that step of faith. Speaking the word. We're here in Luke's gospel. Just turn a page back. Luke's gospel chapter 4, verse 38 and 39. And this is Jesus ministering to Peter's mother-in-law. So you know Jesus loves everyone. And it says in verse 38, it says, Now he arose from the synagogue, and he entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife, mother, was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her, and he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose, and he served them. And so this is where Jesus is just speaking the word. And why is Jesus speaking the word? Because he knows there's life in the word. And when he spoke this word of healing, of resurrection power to this woman, well, she was immediately healed. He just spoke the word. You remember the centurion soldier, Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. He came to Jesus and he said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come to my house, but speak the word only and my servant will be healed. Well, then he marveled at that man's faith. And then later, when that centurion was going back to see about his servant, they shared with him the hour that that man was ministered to. It was the same hour that Jesus sent the word. So you put all of those dots together and that when the spoken word is delivered, then life can be received and needs can be met. Then laying on of hands, Luke's gospel, chapter 4 and verse 40. And when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases or different kinds of diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them, and he healed them. Verse 41 is worth reading also. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. So the laying on of hands. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, which is one of the more recorded ways in which Jesus ministered to the needs of people. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, and verse 10 through 17, we'll read this account says, now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity uh, 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. She was helpless. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and he said to her, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the rulers of the synagogues answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord answered him and he said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? And so ought not this woman or should not this woman uh, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. I just, you can see where the Lord ministered in the means and the method in which he ministered to this woman, as well as uh, you can see uh, earlier in Luke's account, 
in chapter 4 that there were multitudes of people that he laid his hands on and they were ministered to. And uh, we can relegate that to a time and place, and we can say that was Jesus and that was then, and here we are now, and how does this impact or work in our lives today? Well, if you just go back, if you would, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, you'll see how this principle or this truth, and which is really a fundamental or foundational truth of the church laying it on of hands, it's a... It's a Fundamental doctrine, it's one of the six foundational truths doctrinally of the church, what the church should be practicing. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, and this is part of the Great Commission, in verse 18, and they'll take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly, anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And verse, uh, the latter part, and they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, who's he talking to there? So that we know that he's just not talking to, uh, you know, the uh, 12 apostles. Let's go to verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. And then so it's those who believe in his name. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Do you believe that there's power and life in the name of Jesus? I do. To the point that you're willing to lay hands on people and let God help them recover? Because God brings the healing. So what, the laying on of hands, why, why is that significant? So I want to go back to a couple of biblical truths. One is that when someone's not feeling well, they don't want anyone to be close to them. And sometimes that's for good reason. We, we don't want to pass on that sickness to anybody else. So it's a sign of compassion. But sometimes we just don't feel like, you know, we're, we don't feel ourselves. So we're somewhat under the weather that can make some people irritable or difficult to be around. So just don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't be around me. Don't be close to me. And yet, you know, through, through the ministry of the laying on of hands, uh, we're able to, to affirm that, no, we want to minister to you. Not because we're something special, but because the Lord has made provision for you. And the Lord wants you well. And I know you're not feeling well, and I know you're under the weather, and I know you're concerned about me, but we're concerned about you. We're concerned to the point that we're willing to take a step of faith, and we believe that laying hands on you, you'll catch what we have, and we won't catch what you have. Great, great testimony. John G. Lake, a missionary to South Africa, and he was over there during the bubonic plague, and he was thoroughly convinced that it was the Lord's will to heal. And yet there were multitudes of people that were passing away. Yet he was getting to as many people as he could with this message and ministering as often as he could to those who were being tormented by this plague. So finally a group of medical doctors made their way over to South Africa because they heard of this horrific plague that was just devastating these people. And the scientists were amazed and the doctors were amazed when they showed up that Dr. Lake was ministering to people and yet he had no protective clothing on. And they asked him, how are you among these people and you yourself not have, this is very contagious, how is it that you have not contracted the bubonic plague? And he made this one outstanding statement. He said, I believe that the law of Christ, of life in Christ Jesus in me is greater than the law of sin and death that's working in them. I believe that the law, the law is an absolute, of life that's in Christ Jesus that's working in me is greater than the law of sin and death that's working in them. And they said, how are you doing this? And he says, he said, let me demonstrate. And he said, you know that when someone passes away of this plague, one of the things that happens is they excrete a foam out of their mouth. And if you take some of that and you put it under your microscope, you'll see that there's many living organisms of the bubonic plague that will show up on your slide. And they did that, and they found that it was filled with the plague. And he says, if you'll take that foam and you'll put it on my hand and then examine my hand under the microscope, you'll notice the moment it hits my hand, it'll die. Well, they took him at that challenge, put some on his hand, put it under the microscope, and all of it died right before their eyes. Well, how is that so? Because the laws of God 
are greater than the laws of man. And the power of God and the provision of God is greater than the brokenness and the hurt that's in humanity. It has to be. It's the only way that those needs can be met. I believe, therefore, just as, as Jesus shed his blood, and that blood is powerful enough to make my sins white as snow, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. I believe that same blood that was shed, that was poured out with the stripes on his back, still has enough virtue, still has enough power to meet humanity's needs when it comes to their physical healing and health. I believe that. But you can see that sometimes it's, it's your faith and my faith that comes, and sometimes it's the spoken word, sometimes laying on of hands, and then we'll finish with this one in James chapter 5. If you go back to the latter part of the New Testament, if you hit the book of Hebrews, just take one more page to the right, and you're going to run into the book of James. In James chapter 5, and verse 13 through 15 is what we're going to read. Is any among you suffering? Great question. And they didn't say that, didn't ask all the reasons why, but just, you know, is there suffering in any manner in your life whatsoever? Let him pray. And that's your faith, your faith. Go to the Lord, pray to the Lord. Is any uh, one cheerful? Well, let him sing a song. If you're happy, then sing a song. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Well, sometimes when you're sick, you're suffering. But here we see there's a distinct difference. If you're just suffering, but it's not of sickness. Let's say, as an example, you're suffering because you've been silly or you've been, you know, You've been living apart from the light of God and you're suffering the consequences of your sin. Well, just go to the Lord and pray. If you're suffering because of disobedience and you know there's sins of omission as well as sins of commission. Sometimes, you know, the Lord's dealing with us and we just don't do it. That's omitting it. And sometimes the Lord's ask us not to do something and we just run as hard as we can into it. And you're not alone in either one of those categories. So he's saying, you know, if, if, if you're doing things that, that's bringing suffering into your life, just pray about it. Go to the Lord. And I, I, I promise the Lord's just going to say, stop it. Because his commands have already been given. You know, go and sin no more. In other words, quit it. Just stop doing it. If he asks you to do something, do it. If he asks you not to do something, don't do it. He's got his reasons. In other words, don't test the Lord. If he asks you to do something, don't try to figure it out before you do it. Just go do it, and then the testimony will take care of it. The fruit will take care of it. If he's told us not to do something, well, don't say, well, I want to do it anyway and go do it. Well, that's not, that, that, that's not a, a good place to be, and I, I promise you, that's no place to be. So let's not do it. But let's just pray. But then he no, notice here in verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Thank you for watching today's message. If you'd like to know more about today's message or the ministry here at Living Word Fellowship in Knoxville, Iowa, please call 641-828-7119 or visit us online at lwfknoxville.com. If you are in the Knoxville, Iowa area, please stop by and see us on Sundays at 10 a.m. or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at 321 East Robinson, where there's always something for everyone.